Good. Theo Spangler left Delta Junction, Alaska when she was 15 and headed out to see the world. She has oh, lived oh. in Santa Cruz, Berkeley, Lugano, Switzerland, Paris, Cannes, New York, Washington, D.C., Guanajuato, Mexico, Trinidad, California, London, Provincetown, and most recently, Southwest France. Is that all? <laughs> she has written three and a half novels, and while she waits for fame to strike, <laughs> she earns her keep writing articles for online sites like USA Today Travel, eHow, SFGate, and LegalZoom. Thanks. Thank you guys very much. the river after the worst flood in its history. It was springtime and cleanup was about to begin. Everything was muddy and damaged and many fragile things were lost forever. I rented a small cabin in a double row of cabins. Five cabins faced four others across a garden patio that ran thin and long between them. The garden was gone, the flowering bushes bony and bare, mm. but the redwood sign atop the entryway trellis remained, garden court. Vines had covered the trellis before the flood. They were all dead now, stunned, then drowned by the overpowering intrusion, and the thin vine fingers still clasped the trellis so tightly that they would break if you tried to remove them. You had to pass through that trellis every time you entered garden court. A wooden fence guarded the cabin complex, but it had not helped at all to keep the river out. The rising silk brown water took no notice of it, first passing under it and later spilling over the top. Eight of the nine cabins had been completely submerged. The ninth had floated away, down River Road. It was the last of the road. Mine was next to us. My cabin had been hastily cleaned and repaired. The inner surfaces were freshly white, but there was no mistaking that something had happened. The odor of damp shadowed the fragrance of the air freshener, and if you leaned against the walls, they made a hollow, squishing sound. A team of repairmen still worked on the other cabins. I saw them carrying sheetrock up the footpath, two men to a board. They muttered, morning, ma'am and eyed my body when I passed, but otherwise they kept themselves. The three cabins across the footpath from mine sat on a raised wooden deck. At lunch break, the workmen would sprawl on this deck and exchange stories about the devastation. A short gruff man named Doug was in charge. He liked to play with the two husky puppies from next door and sang little songs to them. When the men teased him about it and called him Dougie Wuggy, they said, <laughs> Lick it off my zipper. The two puppies belonged to the people who lived behind my cabin on the other side of the high fence. Several women with children and a dozen men. The workers said they were Mexican. My cabin was built into the fence so I could see their yard through my back window. On Sundays, the men would use the yard between the fence and their house as a place to get together. They would play mariachi music very loud on their car radios and sit in the cars or on the cars and drink beer. Their yard overflowed with old cars, but none of them ran. The men would line up at 4th and Main in the early morning to ride in the back of the truck to the vineyards. The men kept the mother dog tied on a rope behind the house, but the puppies ran free. Mornings, they would slide into the courtyard near my cabin through a gap in the fence boards. One was fuzzy yellow and spunky with confidence. The other was soft and smaller, brown and shy. I called them Butterball and Wimpy. <laughs> The workmen patted both of them and fed them scraps. Another dog lurked in garden court that spring, a skeletal pit bull, snatched up whatever food the puppies left. It seemed to live in the cabin complex, but no one claimed it, and it spent the afternoons lying uneasily on the footpath. The skin on its rump looked raw and mangy, and scars marked its neck. The brute, the men called it. 
The dog catcher came after it several times, but the dog would slink through the gap in the fence into the Mexican's yard and disappear. The tenants returned to the cabin across the footpath from mine a few days after I moved in. It was one of the three small cabins built into the deck, the last in the row on that side. From my kitchen window, I saw a man and a woman carrying boxes up the stairs to the deck. The woman was stocky and wore a shapeless purple sweater that hung loose over her broad belly. She smoked a cigarette and scowled. The man was lanky with dark hair and beard, and he looked young, very young. I saw them again the next day. The woman wore open-toed Birkenstock shoes with white socks, graying trousers, and the same royal purple sweater draping long over her square hips and belly. She pushed up the sleeves of the sweater, but a cuff gave way, covering her wrist and most of one's small fist. She shoved it up impatiently. As she bent to lift a box, her sleeve slipped down again. It had a hole worn in the elbow. When I left my cabin in the afternoon, carefully locking the door behind me, the woman was still moving things in. She glanced at me, put the box she was carrying on a bench near the door of her cabin, and took a cigarette out of a pack in her pocket. She walked toward me, inspecting me as she came, the face, the hair, the clothes, but giving no clues about her judgment. She was quite short, and she marched on her stubby legs with the intense determination of a young child. Hi, I'm Shay, she said. Her hair hung to her shoulders, limp on top, ratty below, brown, parted in the middle. The stark lines emphasized the lines of her heavy, square-jawed face and bright, wondering eyes like a kitten. Why on earth would you want to move here, she asked me. I mean, now of all times. I watched as she fumbled in a trouser pocket for her cigarette lighter. What to tell her? There was no explaining it. Things had gone wrong, very wrong, rotting from the inside out. And I had come. I reached for words like retreat or sabbatical, but had a sudden image of a broken dog crawling to the woods to die. As it turned out, no response was necessary. She was not listening for a reply. She lit the cigarette and continued quickly in her story. We lived here before the flood, she said. I lost everything. Larry moved my TV to the top of the refrigerator when we left, and my other good stuff moved it up high. The water was only way steep then. I never thought it might get worse. I just never thought of it. I lost my books, my papers, food in my cabinets. Thank God the stuff from my mom's estate was in storage. I lost everything else. The man materialized behind her silently. The dark beard and hair cast his face ghostly pale, like a thin cloud in a sunless sky. He was tall, but slight, insubstantial, his strong, perfect teeth out of place in his fragile face. He remained a few feet behind Shay, closer to the door. This is Larry. She turned slightly and gestured toward him with her cigarette. I was just telling her how I lost everything. We got your car out, he offered. Ha, she barked. A lot of good it does. She rolled her eyes and scowled. Where am I supposed to go? And there was the river. Slow, steady, powerful, its deliberate predator's tread occupying a part of my mind all day, all night. It began somewhere far away and ended in the Pacific Ocean a few miles past the town. Along the way, somewhere, the river must have sparkled. Silver water laughing and dancing over shiny rocks like in fairy tales. But in town, the river flowed dark and somber, spell smelling of mud and sewage and small things that had died. River Road ran beside it to the ocean, both river and road set deep between small, rounded hills. In town, the river valley broadened, and two streets flanked River Road on each side, first and second closest to the river, then third and fourth, that was it. After fourth was a dirt alley, and garden courts stretched long from one to the other. I found one cafe in town at the east end of Third Street where it teed into Carlington Road's wood. It had been flooded out. When it reopened, the cafe displayed photographs of the flood. One was a large aerial view of the town underwater. Others showed the rescue boats, livestock on roofs, floating debris. People would stop by and look for their friends and their houses in the photos. If you did not know anyone in the photos, all you saw was a cold, churning river, 
Gray water swelling its banks, muddy water dispassionately rising, sweeping before it almost by accident, everything small, delicate, or on the loose. Most of the houses remained, but they were left dirty and empty inside, bereft of their wholeness and purpose, like the standing bush trunks stripped of their leaves. My own emptiness blended smoothly into the landscape of desolation. It was for that, perhaps, that I had come. The people in the photographs were all trying to get away with a few precious things, or with nothing. Their faces were loose like drunks, and the only smiles were shiny, shallow smiles. The sandbags had done no good at all. The water swept them away quickly, irreparably. There was no fighting back against the rising tide. There was only the strength to stumble away. When I returned to my cabin, Shay sat on a chair on the deck drinking a cup of coffee. She had finished moving things for the day. She waved me down, squinting into the cool sunlight. You'd think they'd do a decent repair job, she said. Then she curled her tongue out and up toward her nose, preparing to speak again. I mean, they got all this insurance money, she said. It floods every three or four years, and they get their 50 thou. Of course, they don't bother to fix the places up. When I plugged in my vacuum, the wall started hissing at me. Shay was going to a friend's house to take a bath. She spoke the word bath with a soft Boston A. I saw her later, trudging down the footpath, carrying a little leather overnight case. Scowling, she circled wide round the wary pit bull and was gone. The cabins did not have baths. They had small shower stalls and sinks. The sink in my cabin fell off the wall the first time I tried to turn it on. It looks straight <coughs> on the floor, not like a sink at all. I told the man Doug about it, but he said the repair crew would finish my cabin. If something went wrong, it was for the maintenance crew to fix. The maintenance crew had only one man, since everybody else had been hired away. They said he had no experience. He put my sink back on the wall, though, and it still ran water. Many houses in the hills remained without running water. The local newspaper carried an article about a woman who was raped by four locals. She lived in the hills and hitchhiked to town to get water. They picked her up on the way back. One after the other, the men raped her. She said she was not angry, just tired, that she would not open her legs to a man for a long, long time, that she would live alone forever. That night, as I lay on my mattress trying to sleep, a man took water from the host tap in front of my cabin. I heard a noise outside my window and saw his shoulders, head and shoulders, dark against dark through the pain. I turned on the cabin light and saw with clarity my own reflection in the window, a stranger, stiff and staring. I switched it off quickly, blinding myself. After a while, I went outside with a flashlight and saw the hose outlet, still running. The man was gone. Only the mangy pit bull was there, in the doorway of the next cabin, curled tight on the welcome mat against the cold night. He glanced up the whites of his eyes show.